Complications of corneal ulcer can be classified to those before perforation and those after perforation. Before perforation, a corneal ulcer can result in opacity. Opacity can be minimal or extensive depending on the depth of the ulcer. A faint opacity is known as nebula. A dense opacity is known as lecoma. In between, we have a macula. A dense opacity may give way under the effect of intraocular pressure, forming keratoctasia. It's a bulging of part of the cornea, the opaque part of the cornea. Ectasia means bulging, keratokeratitis, cornea. Another problem is facet, where there is a defect in this depression of the surface covered with epithelium. This is transient. On the healing process, the fibrous tissue is laid down and it takes some time to fill the whole defect and the surface is of a normal level. So over this period, you get a depressed area covered with epithelium known as facet. Another problem if toxins passes inside, we get aridocyclitis. Some of the cases of a corneal ulcer, even you get a severe aridocyclitis resulting in formation of hypopion, a pus and anterior chamber. Another problem is a dysmetoseal. If the perforation gets deep, if the necrosis gets deep and deep with loss of tissues, then we are remained here with the dysmus membrane. The dysmus membrane at the bottom of this area will bulge under the effect of the intraocular pressure, and we get this dome-shaped membrane at the bottom of the ulcer. This is a dysmetoseal. If this dysmus is also injured, then we get a through-and-through -through perforation. Lastly, we get what we call a pseudo trigium, which I'm going to explain in a minute. So here we get different grades of opacity from faint, we can see through, to very dense, we don't see anything through it. Also here, this is an ectasia. If you see the curvature of the cornea, it's bulging here, or a depression or bulging at the bottom of the ulcer. See the curvature here? It should be like that, but this area is bulging. So the trigium, it's a triangular encroachment of the conjunctiva on the cornea. It happens in certain cases if we do the technique of conjunctivoplasty. Conjunctivoplasty is something we can do if there is a resistance or delayed healing of an ulcer. If you have an ulcer not responding to the regular treatment, then we're going to dissect the conjunctiva nearby. We pull it to cover the area of the ulcer, so we can get more blood supply, more defense mechanism to the area of ulceration. This will help healing. On the following days, the conjunctiva, the elastic conjunctiva, will recede back. So the whole conjunctiva will be back, except this location because of adhesions. So we get this triangular encroachment. This is to be differentiated from true trigium. In true trigium, it usually in the horizontal level, either nasal or temporal, while pseudotrigium can come from any location. Complications after perforation. Here two examples. This is a very thin cornea, but the anterior chamber is still formed, so there is no perforation here. And here we get a very thin cornea, and you can see the iris, but there is perforation, because the uh, iris is on the back of the cornea, there is no anterior chamber. So once there is perforation, aqueous comes out, and the anterior chamber is lost, and the iris is to the back of the cornea. If you put some fluorescein here, then the clear aqueous will make a track in this tear film stained with the fluorescein, and this is known as the river sign. Now, what are the complications? If you have a thin perforation here, then iris to the back, when healing or care, you may end with some peripheral anterior cyanica. If the anterior chamber is left flat like this for enough time, adhesions may occur between the iris and the cornea in any location. 
To see this, if you put a gonioscope, this is the normal where you can see the trabecular meshwork. But here, this area you can see a trabecular meshwork, but the remaining there is synechia, extensive synechia here. So if the synechia is more than 180 degrees, the patient may suffer from glaucoma. Now here we get a large perforation, a large defect, so that the iris is pr prolapsing outside. In the following days, if healing occurs, there will be a layer of fibrous tissue here, forming a pseudo new cornea here with the iris amalgamated in it. This is a, a result in a dense opacity with the iris adherent to the back. We call it lecoma adherent. Here, dense opacity and the iris is tented shape adherent to the back. Another example of a dense opacity with the iris adherent to the back. This is lecoma adherent. Sometimes this area of fibrous tissue is weak and start to give way bulging like this. We call this an, a partial anterior staphyloma. Staphyloma means ectasia of the outer coat lined by the inner coats. So here the outer coat is the cornea and the inner coats is the iris. Anterior staphyloma means it is on the cornea. Partial means it affects only a part of the cornea. Here you get a corneal opacity with areas of partial anterior staphyloma. Here this area is bulging. Some points are more bulging than the others. This is affection of part of the cornea only. Now, imagine that they have a small ulcer, but not in the periphery, just in the center in front of the pupil. Once ulceration is there, aqueous is out, AC flat, iris to the back of the cornea, lens is nearby. If healing or care, stop by forming some plug of fibrous fibrin, then AC will reform iris is back. Healing should continue and everything will be fine and I'm going to be left with an opacity. But if the patient gets cough, then the plug will be out and AC will fall again. Then some healing with fibrin plug, but the patient still got chronic cough, some flat AC again, then healing, then flat AC. If this is continue for enough time, the healing process, the epithelium will try to cover the area, but there is the defect here, then the epithelium will cover the sides of the perforation. Once this happens, then we are ended with a fistula. There is no more healing because of a smooth surface covering the area. For healing, we need to destroy this epithelium lining the fistula. Also, another complication is anterior polar cataract because the lens was here near to the toxins and the metabolism of the fibers formed at this time will result in lens opacity. To differentiate it from congenital anterior polar cataract, in our situation we have a corneal opacity in the center. Now, a second example here, if the perforation a big perforation, but not to the side, it occurs including most of the cornea, as in this example. So we have a huge central perforation here, then the iris will come out, prolapse. If healing occurs, then there will be fibrous tissue here, including the cornea and the iris, and we get what we call a pseudo cornea. It's not a real cornea, it's a fibrous tissue replacing the cornea with the iris amalgamated in. This will end in glaucoma because normally the aqueous should find its way through the pupil to the angle, and this is lost here. So there will be a total anterior staphyloma, bulging of the cornea with the iris line this bulging. Here, a huge part of the cornea, we get this mass coming out of the cornea covered with fibrosis and epithelium. This is a total anterior staphylum. So perforation can be central or eccentric. Small perforation healed will result in preferent eusynechia. Eccentric larger perforation will result in lecoma adherence or may follow to be
partial and acute staphyloma. Small sense of perforation will result in fistula, and large sense of perforation will result in total and acute staphyloma. Other complications. Infection can get inside, then you get an endophthalmitis with sudden perforation, massive drop of pressure can result in expulsive hemorrhage. Cataract may be there, subluxation of the lens, dislocation of the lens.